All right, so I am continuing my series on leadership, and we're going to be doing a few more sermons as well on Sunday nights in general. I'm going to be teaching on different leadership qualities, and uh, the quality that I'm going to be teaching on tonight is strength. If you want to be a good leader, you need to have strength. You need to be strong. And this, like I said last week, this week as well, this applies to more than just spiritual leadership. I mean, this goes for all manner of leadership. And, you know, whether you're a man, woman, boy, girl, this still, you're still going to be able to learn something tonight because we all are going to end up being leaders in one way or another. And we need to be able to, um, to, to be a good leader. Uh, but, uh, you know, everyone can learn. But I, I really, you know, men really need to focus on this. Because you are, God has designed men naturally to be leaders. And we need to make sure as men especially that we're going to lead the best way that we possibly can. You know, the Bible says like with Moses, you know, would to God that, that all of God's children were, were prophets, right? That, that that all the men of God would, would go out and, and preach God's word. That we need to have strong leadership. We need to have a lot of strong leaders, especially within the church, but outside as well. So we started off in Deuteronomy chapter 31, and this is Moses pretty much passing the torch to Joshua. This is one great leader, Moses, which definitely was a great leader. I mean, how can you deny that? He led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and, you know, parted the Red Sea. Obviously, everything's done through the power of God. But, I mean, he was in charge. They fought battles. They won victories. He's leading them around. And they're following him. They are following him. Now, there's been times where the people have complained. There's been times where, where people have been bitter against Moses because they didn't like their situation. But at the end of the day, he was a good leader. I mean, he, he was, we'll get into this later, but, you know, he was humble. He was offering to, to sacrifice himself for the people, you know, all good qualities and attributes. We'll get to that one in another, another lesson. But um, tonight I want to focus on the strength because this is what he focused on when he was basically sending Joshua out and explaining to Joshua, okay, now you're going to lead this people because God's not going to let me into the promised land. He had his own sin that he was being punished for. God was not going to let him in. So, so Joshua had to continue and take the charge. Now, and of course, we've been reading all about Joshua in that, in that whole event through the book of Joshua on Wednesday night. But look at what he says here in verse number 7. The Bible says, And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. For thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. So what he's lead, the advice is, anyway, look, you need to be strong. You're going to lead this people. You're going to be the one everyone's looking to. And if everyone's looking to you, you need to have strength. Because oftentimes, and especially in this case, they're going off to battle. They're going to go get in some fights. They're going to get in some wars. And being in a battle is, can be a very scary environment to be in. And if you're going to have someone who's a good leader, you can't have your leader shaking in his boots and quivering at the sight of opposition, at the sight of other armed forces, at the sight of some other people that might threaten your life. Because you're the one that people are looking to for direction. As a leader, you're the one leading the charge. You're the one saying, all right, this is what we're going to do. Don't worry about their faces. Don't worry about their weapons. Don't worry about this stuff. We've got this. We're going to be strong. We're going to beat them. You know, that's what a leader needs to do. Bring people in and, and have the courage to do so. Now, the great benefit that we have, especially when this is applied being a good leader, when it comes to spiritual things, is that if we're doing what's right, we know that God is with us and God is for us. So that source of our strength, see, most of the people can look to the leader and kind of gain some strength off of the strength that the leader is putting out. But the leader needs to draw strength from somewhere and the leader needs to be drawing his strength from God. And that's a benefit we have. But see, as a good leader, this ties in as well. I don't have a separate point for this, but having the faith, is, where, is how you're going to be a strong leader. Because once you have that faith, as Moses explained to Joshua, he says, look, the Lord, 
He it is that doth go before thee. You have to be strong. You have to good courage. You have to lead this people. But you know what? God's going before you. God is with you. God has that strength. <coughs> He's your buckler. He's your shield. He's your strength. So we can feed off of him, especially as a leader, feed off of the strength of the Lord to then be a strong leader yourself and to show and be the example to demonstrate how not to back down in the face of opposition. Strength is a very important attribute of being a good leader. Now, of course, it is important for everyone to be strong in a battle, right? Everyone should be relying on the Lord, but especially the leader. The leader has the utmost important. Uh, turn, to, turn back to chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Because like I said before, they're, they're, you know, people are looking to the leader for their strength, for their courage, for their direction. What are we doing? Where are we going? And they're relying on a leader to guide them and to help tell them where, where they need to be and to organize. Look at verse number 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 20. These are some rules, basically, in God's law of Going to battle, like in verse number one, it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So saying, if you see more forces, more people than, against you than what you have, don't worry, don't be afraid. And then it goes on to give a little bit more detail on how it is that they're supposed to uh, deal with their army. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed the wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, another man take her. So basically, he's weeding out people that might have an excuse not to go fight. He's saying, you know what? You don't need to go fight. You don't go fight. You don't go fight. I want the people who are real serious. They don't have, you know, they're not going to be worried about whatever's going on at home and these other reasons that are going to get them distracted from just being full on in the fight. And the leader is doing it, saying, okay, you guys get out of here, you get out of here. Look at verse number eight, though. It says, and the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. So in order for them to even pick out the captains and to find the leaders, they need to make some cuts. Like, you people got to go. If you're not going to be in this fight, if you're going to have some other reason pulling you away from this fight, get out of here. And especially if you're going to be fearful, if you're afraid of what's going to happen, you don't want to go in this fight because you're afraid, get out of here. Why? Because it says, lest his brethren's heart faint as well. The fear is like, a, is like leaven, right? A little leaven could leaven the whole lump. The fear can spread among the people, among the troops. You get one person that starts freaking out, like, oh man, but did you see how many people they have? I mean, look at, look at their weapons. Look at what they got. Look at their defenses. There's no way we could do this. And they start getting real afraid. They're going to start casting doubt in fear unto the people that up to that point, hey, they were ready to go. We're ready to fight. Now all of a sudden they're starting to, to plant these seeds of doubt in their mind and plant this fear in their mind and it starts to spread. And you don't want that happening in a fight, in a battle. That's the last thing you want happening. You need your men to be strong. So you're saying, before we even pick out leaders, let's get all the scaredy cats gone. Let's get them out of here. You don't want to fight? Then get out of here. Notice, they weren't forcing everybody to fight. This wasn't a draft. They're saying, go home. You got some reason not to be here? Then get out of here. We don't want you anyways. You come and fight our fights. And see, that's the attitude that you could have when you're fighting the right fights. When you're in a righteous fight, in a righteous battle, and you can be confident that the Lord is with you, then you could totally have this type of an attitude. But when you've got a war that you're involved in, like the United States gets involved in these wars that we have no business being in, that's why all of a sudden they have to institute drafts and just pull people in. Why? Because people don't want to fight that fight. 
Because they know it's not right. It's not righteous. They don't want to get involved in those fights. That's where you have to start forcing people. But if you're doing what's right, then people should be able to get behind that cause and say, yes, this is right. This is just. This is good. God is for us. If God be for us, who could be against us? Let's go fight. Let's go do this. Let's win this battle. Now, obviously, I'm referencing some physical fights, but the reason why we're even bringing this up is because we're involved in a spiritual fight. We're involved in a spiritual battle. And our fight is just. Our fight is good. We're fighting against the, the, the spiritual darkness in high places and against the evil and the wickedness of this world. It is an important fight. It's an important battle. And we can't have people getting afraid. We can't fear what man can do unto us. And we dead sure can't have leaders that are going to be afraid. I understand when certain people get afraid, younger babes in Christ, new believers might get afraid. That's normal. That's to be expected. That's like putting a six-year-old out on the battlefield, you know, in front of a bunch of people with dangerous weapons, guns pointed at you. Yeah, they're going to be afraid. Because they're a child, of course they're going to be afraid. A lot of new believers are going to be afraid too because they're new. They're young in the faith, right? They're not as experienced. They don't have patience. They don't, they're not as grounded and as found in the truth. But those that have been around, especially people who are leaders, you know, you ought not to be worried about what people are going to do. What drives me nuts the most and just shows how much leadership is lacking is when you have these pastors of churches that are afraid of what sodomites are going to do to them. Oh, we don't want the phone ring. We don't want to be on the news. We don't want any backlash because I'm going to open up my mouth and proclaim how wicked and vile and disgusting homosexuality is. And they get afraid and they tuck their tail between their legs and they say one thing and then they'll go and apologize as soon as they get any attention for it and they're fearful, and they're teaching their flocks to be fearful, and that, all that's going to do is give the enemy more boldness to walk all over you and say, aha, yeah, that's what I thought. We're going to cram this further down your throat. That's why you need the strong leader to stand up and say, no, we're not going to let you cram this down our throat. In fact, you need to get back in the closet. We're going to lead the charge. We're going to lead the fight against this. We're going to stand up. We're going to be strong. And I don't care what you think you can do because God's on our side. And I'm going to do what he told me. I'm going to preach it from the rooftops. That is a leadership quality that is lacking. And if you have any desire to be a leader, make sure you get strength. Make sure you can get resolved to get the job done, no matter what the job is for the Lord. There's been a lot of people, a lot of great leaders in the Bible that have had to do some things that aren't very pleasant, but had to be done anyways. I mean, think about like Samuel. Samuel was a judge of Israel. He had no tolerance for the wickedness, though. He hewed. Remember that he hewed those other kings in pieces because the other people were too weak to do it. He would bring them over here. Now, that's not a pleasant thing. That, I've never done it before. Okay, I've never, I've never hewed people in pieces with a sword. Okay, and I don't, pl I don't plan on doing that. <laughs> but that cannot be a pleasant thing to do. Or when Joshua had to lead the people in and destroy everything in those cities. That it's not, a, it's not something you derive pleasure from, but it's necessary. It's something that God said that needed to be done, and they needed to do it. And someone needed to stand up and say, I'm going to do this work for God. I'm going to be strong, and we're going to do it. And we need leaders that are going to be strong like that. You can't be fearful. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You know, I brought up examples of other great leaders in the Bible, and I kind of touched on David. But um, we're going to see here, obviously David was a king. He's the second king of Israel. But one of the attributes, one of the reasons why David was such a successful leader, I mean, he had people following him. He had people following him, like even when he wasn't king, before he became king, David accumulated a lot of followers. He was a strong leader. He was a good leader and a strong leader. One, I mean, he cared about the people that were following him, but he exhibited strength and, and um, integrity in what he was doing. He was doing what he did for the right reasons. 
He was doing what he was doing in faith uh, in the Lord. And a great example of this, of course, is a famous story of David and Goliath. Look at uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse number 10. The Bible says, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So you have this, yes, he was a giant, but more importantly, it just says he was a Philistine that defied God. Okay, yeah, he happened to be a little bit bigger, but he comes out and he was doing this every day. I defy the armies of the living God. Right? I defy the armies of the Lord. I defy Israel. Come on out here. Bring me a man to fight with me. We'll settle this thing right now. And where Saul was lacking was in that strength and that courage. He had the right fight. He was on the Lord's side. They were doing what was right. He was in the right. And the, here's this guy coming out and defying God. And he had no strength. He had no courage. He was afraid. He was fearful of that enemy. And you know, this one event causes so many more problems for Saul just kind of for the rest of his life. This, after this event, this is what makes him start hating David. This is what just gets him pursuing after David. Why? Because David was a strong leader and Saul was not. And that drove Saul nuts that David actually stood up and did what needed to be done. Mind you, don't forget, we're told that Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. So first of all, just physically speaking, it would make sense. Hey, here's this giant coming out to fight. Saul, you're the king. You're the leader. You're the biggest one of our group. Why don't you go out and fight him? Why don't you lead the way? Why don't you show them that God is with us? And if God be for us, who could be against us? Why don't you go do that? He was afraid too. He didn't know what to do. It took David to come along. David was this you know, young, ruddy kid that was out you know, watching the sheep. He wasn't a warrior. He hadn't been in a bunch of battles. It took him to come up and have the faith and have the guts to say, who is this guy? Why is everyone afraid of him? He's defying God. God's for us. Let's go and do this. Verse 32, it says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Don't, don't worry yourself. Don't fright yourself over him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So he just offers himself up. I'll go do it. Jump down to verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. David understood that God was going to be with him. He's like, I've already had experiences where God has fought for me. God has helped me out. I've been in impossible situations before. I could do it again. Because God's the one doing it. And he gives credit after this is all done too. He always gives credit to the Lord. Because that's the battle he's fighting. It's for God. He wasn't offended at the Philistine against himself. When, when the Philistines, you know, just railing on him and saying, oh, who is this guy? You know, you bring this dog unto me. David didn't say, oh, I'm not a dog. You know, you know he didn't get offended at that. He just said, you know what? You're defying God. And we'll see today now what God does when, when your body, you know, the birds of the, the heaven are feeding on your body. That there is a God in heaven. He was worried about, about him attacking God, not himself. He didn't care about himself. Verse 48, jump down to verse number 48 here in the story. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. There is no fear. He has strength. He has courage. Not a doubt in his mind. He's running at Goliath. He's running right up to him. No hesitation. Why? Because he's a strong leader. And you know what? Everybody's standing around watching him do this. He's not going up there and, you know. Sneaking up to him. 
he's running right out to the battle. Verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. See, he killed their strength, their strength in flesh. He destroyed that. And that made them flee. I mean, that, that just won the whole victory right there. Obviously, God gets the credit for it, but David had to stand up and do it. David needed the strength. David needed the courage to go forth and do that. Where would they still be sitting if, if David didn't step up? Step up to the challenge. Well, you'd still have the loudmouth heathen blaspheming God. That's what you'd have. And that's what we have today, and that's what we've had for a long time. The loudmouth Goliath has been defying the living God, defying Christianity, and you have these weak, spineless pastors that won't stand up, that won't defy Goliath, that, will, that are too cowardly to run into the fight, to run into the battle and say, I don't even care if nobody follows me because I'm going to do what's right for God. But if you had enough people like this, you have enough Davids, you're going to have plenty of people come out and follow you. Why? Because God's going to be with you. And God will win the victory for you. But we need men of faith. We need strong leaders to go out and, and push the charge forward. Just sitting around, being fearful, wondering, oh, what are they going to do? Oh, I don't want them coming here. Oh, I don't want to protest in my church. bunch of pansies. Turn over to chapter 18, then we see the result of this. In verse number 5, it says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Because of his courage, because of his strength, and going forth into the battle, that earned him respect. That earned him the place to be a leader. People looked up to him after that. Why? Because he had courage and strength to go up and do what needed to be done. He did what was right, and, and he did it without hesitation. People want to follow someone like that. That's going to win the hearts and minds of a lot of people. You could really be a lot more effective being a strong leader, getting a group of people coming forward and, and going forth to the battle. So I'll flip over to 1 Kings now, chapter number 2. 1 Kings, chapter number 2. We're going to see the instruction of this strong leader, David, that he gives to his son. We saw the instruction that Moses gave unto Joshua, telling him to be strong and be of good courage. You've got a lot of battles ahead of you. And now we got the, the advice, the counsel of a strong king himself who had a lot of people love him and follow him and respect him, giving instruction unto his son who's going to take the throne. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. He's saying, I'm about to leave. I'm about to die. And this is what I'm going to leave you with. Be strong. He's about to lead all the children of Israel as king. Be strong and show yourself to be a man. You know, that should be something that's just inherent in men anyways. Again, that, that attribute of strength. We need to make sure that we're not, as men especially, allowing ourselves to become weak. Show yourself to be a man. All men should be strong. Husbands need to be strong for their wives. The woman is the weaker vessel. In more ways than one, not just physically speaking, but emotionally too. Men need to be the rock, that strength in that marriage. 
to, to be able to get through the difficult times and that your wife can look to you for, for some comfort and guidance and strength because you're being strong. And then the kids need to look up to their dads also as being a strong leader. Be strong. Be a good leader in the house. Show thyself a man. Uh, turn, if you would, to first. If you turn, if you would, to James. I'll just read for you from 1 Chronicles 28. Again, this is more instruction from David unto Solomon. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9 says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart, and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Do, do it. Don't put it off. Be strong, do the work, do the action, and get going. And be strong. We're going to see this advice is given so many times. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch ye and stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. I'm sorry, that's 1 uh, Corinthians. If I, I don't know if I said the right reference or not. Stand fast in the faith. Fast means you're, stand, you're unmovable. I am standing firm in my faith. Quit you like men, be strong. A leader also needs to be able to provide direction. Part of being strong and showing that strength is being confident in your decisions and being able to move forward and not, and not showing any you know, wishy-washiness and oh, I don't really know. You know. That's not very strong. When you can't make solid choices and solid decisions, they say, this is what we're going to do. You're in James chapter 1. The Bible says in verse number 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Again, the source of the strength is the faith. The source of where your confidence comes from is from the faith. The source of the strength of a good leader <coughs> is faith in God providing that to you and leading your way and directing your path. You need to have that faith in order to not waver. To not question, to say, oh, I don't know. Should we be doing this? Oh, I don't know. No, you need to have the faith to know we are doing the right thing. For it says, continuing on in verse 6, For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You don't want an unstable leader. That's why you need a strong leader. That's why you need someone who's able to make decisions and not just be tossed around like a wave, just to and fro. One day we're over here, another day we're over here. I don't know. We'll see what happens. You can't be double-minded because that, that is just instability. Now, a leader isn't always going to make the right choices, but the best leader, I mean, everyone makes mistakes. And you have leaders in charge and power. They're going to end up making a mistake at some point. But the good leaders are going to be the ones that you just make the choices and you go through with it and you keep doing it. You don't just keep second-guessing yourself. And, oh, I don't know if this is right. I don't, you know. If you do that, you're never going to end up doing anything. You're just going to be holding off and waiting back until I could just be confident of just knowing, you know, is this a safe route? Is this exactly what I can do? A, a, a strong leader needs to be able to move forward and press on and not be double-minded. We see another example of this. If you want, you could turn to um, Mark chapter 6. But in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see Elijah calling out the people. 1 Kings 18, 21 says, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. He was telling them to make a decision. Look, if the Lord's God, then just serve the Lord. And if Baal's God, then serve Baal, right? Don't, why, why are you just stuck in this middle ground of saying, well, I don't know. I mean, we kind of like the Lord. We kind of like Baal. We'll, maybe we'll just worship both. And he's saying, how long are you going to just halt and just wait and not just make up your mind? Because, of course, this is the chapter where 
he's got all these prophets of Baal and it's just him and they're going to offer up the sacrifices and he said, you know, let the Lord that answers by fire, let the God answers by fire, he, you know, let him be God, right? And of course he makes that his, you know, he makes fun of all the, the Baal worshipers that are cutting themselves and chanting and doing all their hocus pocus stuff. And of course to no avail because it's not a real God. And then God eats up his uh, Elijah's sacrifice with fire coming down from heaven and you know after he already poured water all over everything and licked up all the the water out of the dust and and, and of course that was uh, God that answered but he says here in verse 22 says then said Elijah unto the people I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord but Baal's prophets are 450 men so you got 450 people over there and you've got me you got the Lord you've got Baal make up your mind choose who you're gonna serve Obviously, there was a lack of good leadership in Elijah's day, to say the least, if he was the only one willing to stand up against the wickedness. Just think about the influence that has, just what he said. Hey, there's 450 prophets over there. They're the majority. You have all of these people saying Baal is God. That's going to have a lot more influence on people. Saying, well, I mean, this is 450 people say it. I mean, you're just one person, so why should I believe you? Well, who was right? We know who was right. Because numbers doesn't make you right, but it does have influence over people. There was totally a lack of good leadership in Elijah's day, and if there was better leadership, because we know that Elijah wasn't alone in his belief, in his faith. That's evidence. The Bible says, God says he's reserved 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee unto Baal. Well, where were the leadership? Where were the leaders? Where are the people also standing up and saying, I'll back you up, Elijah? I'm with you. Where were they? Bunch of weak cowards, not willing to stand up. And it gets to the point to where, you know, even this, Elijah got to the point where he wanted to die. We saw, you know, Moses got to the point where he wanted to die. All these men of God, they're standing up because they feel so isolated and alone. Hey, we need more leaders, more strong leaders to, to help give the other leaders strength too and be like, hey, look, I'm with you. Let's go do this thing together. Let's fight this fight. We need more. You need to have guts. You need to have the guts like Elijah and David to lead the charge when everyone else is afraid or when you seem to be the only one on God's side. You still need to have that courage. You need to have strength. And you do that, you'll be a good leader. You also need the guts to call out wickedness even if it's against a ruler, against someone that could potentially harm you. That's why we're in Mark chapter 6, look at verse number 17. This is about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was another good leader. John the Baptist was out baptizing people in the, in the wilderness. He paved the way for Jesus Christ. He got a great following of people and pointed them all to Jesus. He was a great leader. To the point where Jesus said, Among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Basically saying that he's like the greatest guy to have ever lived outside of Jesus Christ himself. So we know he was a good leader. Well, what landed John in prison? Look at verse number 17. It says, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. John the Baptist was not a respecter of persons. John the Baptist had courage. He had guts to stand up for the word of God, even if it meant physical harm to himself even when it meant imprisonment. And if we're going to have strong leaders, you need to be able to stand up and make that stand. I mean, look at Jesus Christ. They threatened him with his life. He didn't back down. The apostles didn't back down, at least not after the resurrection of Christ. They kept moving forward. Turn to Acts chapter 5. We'll see an example of that. Acts chapter 5. Great leadership. The apostles were great leaders. How many people did they win to Christ? How many people did they teach and train in, in spiritual things and the ways of God? I mean, it's awesome the amount of work that they did. But look at this attitude that they had. Look at verse number 27 in Acts chapter 5. The Bible says, 
And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. This is like the cops, right? These days, what are you doing in this apartment complex? Didn't we tell you you can't do that here? Didn't we already arrest you last week for this? Didn't we already instruct you that you can't be out here doing this? And here you are doing it again. The weak leaders are going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I won't come back again. I won't do this. Right? Oh, please don't punish me. I'm sorry, I won't let it happen again. And then they'll never go back. And they're going to let those people die and go to hell. Because they're worried about what man can do unto them. Instead of being worried about what God's going to do unto them by disobeying his command. We get to these points, especially as a society, as a culture, and a nation, where freedoms are going to be lost. Wickedness is going to prevail because there's no strong leaders to stand up and stop. Just stop the, the, the wicked force from moving forward. Resist. They called these people in, the, the apostles in. Hey, didn't we tell you? You can't teach in this name. And you filled Jerusalem. You didn't listen to us. You filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Look at verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Where is that attitude among Baptists today? Yeah. Now you have a bunch of state worshipers. Yeah. Oh no, we have, to, we have to follow all the rules of the land and every single thing that anyone says to you, you do, and you don't have to be some jerk and, and disobey when some cop comes up to you and tells you you can't preach the gospel. You just better do what they say. No! Amen. Is that what the apostles did? Sure. Absolutely not. I'm not going to worship the state. I'm not going to worship the police or the military or anybody else who these Fox News Baptists want to worship. Who are more concerned with politics than they are about serving the Lord. When they're told not to do something that God told them to do, their answer was simple. We ought to obey God rather than men. <laughs> You're going to try to kick me out of here? Well, guess what? I'm going to obey God. I don't care what you have to say. And you know what I'm going to start doing? I haven't had this happen much. I mean, thankfully, we've been pretty much at peace. No one's been harassing us at all. I've, has anyone said anything at all late? Like, even since we started? I don't know. To my knowledge, once, maybe, okay, so maybe one time, and all the soul winning that's been going, this is the first time, or maybe you might have told me before, I don't remember. But um, just getting any type of opposition at all, my response is going to be just, first of all, to the people, whether it be a cop or whether it be a manager or whatever, to say, are you a Christian? Because most likely they're probably going to say yes. And just confront them on that level. It's like, do you know that God said that we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature? Are you going to stand in opposition to what I'm trying to do here and to fulfill what God said to do? You're going to stand here and tell me I can't do what God told me to do? Who do you think you are? The Bible told me to obey God rather than men. Shame on you. It's what you ought to say. Shame on these people. If they say they're a Christian, shame on you. Yeah. Trying to kick someone out from preaching the gospel to people. That's a shame. Verse number 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. So not only does it say, hey, yeah, well, of course we're going to obey God. He goes further now to tell them to their faces that, yeah, Jesus raised, was raised from the dead, who you killed. You crucified Jesus. The blood's on your hands. They're calling him out to their faces. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are as witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. 
When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. That made them angry. He knew that was going to make them angry. But he said it anyways. Why? Well, one, because it cut to the heart. People need to be cut to the heart. They need strong language sometimes and just sharp truth to pierce through their cold, wicked heart. Now, they reacted improperly because they could have been pierced to the heart and been humbled and say, oh, he's right. Maybe I should get right with God. But instead, they go, oh, he's right, let's kill him. Oh, he's on to us, let's murder him. I don't like that he said that. You need to be able to boldly stand up for the truth and not be silenced. Don't let some God, and you know, even when I was talking, if it, it doesn't have to be a manager, it doesn't have to be, you know, the cops, even just some God hater coming out trying to harass you, and oh, you shouldn't, don't let them push you around. Now, you don't have to go off and like start fights with people or whatever. I mean, hey, don't let them waste your time either, but at the same time, don't let them discourage you, keep you from doing, you know, I don't know how many times I've had people say, you know, you go to their door and you're like, they don't want to hear you, say, okay, well, see you later, you know. And they're like, yeah, and don't go to their house either. Well, excuse me, but I am going to their house. Don't, don't let those people tell you where you can go and whose door you can knock on. Don't let them discourage you from doing so because you just need to be worried about doing God's work. We need to be prepared. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians 6, the last place we'll look at tonight. Ephesians chapter 6. Be prepared to withstand all of the attacks especially as a leader. Like I said, the leader is the one that everyone's going to be looking to. The leader is going to be given the direction. So the leader needs to be strong. Everyone ought to be strong. We all ought to be like individual leaders and just to strive for that strength in these areas. But dead sure, especially if you want to be leading people, it's not a choice. You have to be strong. You have to be bold. You have to have guts. You have to stand up for what's right. You can't back down. People are going to be relying on you. So in Ephesians 6, again, this could be an entire sermon in and of itself also, but what we see in Ephesians 6 is just how are you going to be able to withstand? How are you going to be able to keep going? You need the whole armor of God. This is a spiritual battle. We've seen so many verses relating to being strong in battles. Because we're in a spiritual battle. Well, here's the armor that we need to have in order to withstand as a leader, as someone who's going to be strong. Look at verse number 10 of Ephesians 6. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. And armor is a, is a defense. It's going to give you strength, right? It's going to help strengthen you from the attacks of the enemy. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That is our fight. That is our fight today. We need strong leaders in this fight, in this spiritual fight. Identify the enemies who are the principalities, the, the, those in charge. So, you, know, you see prince, the prince in the Bible. Prince is often the king or the you know, principles, like the first. Um, that's where the, the, the root word comes from, or the principal at a school. I mean, they're the person in charge, right? So we are fighting against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. There, are, there is darkness in this world, and there are rulers of that darkness. That's who our enemies are. That's who we're fighting against. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. They ascend up to areas of control and power, especially politically, but in many areas, influence, spiritual wickedness in high places. That is who we're fighting against. And because it's in high places, they're going to have power. They're going to try to silence you. They're going to oppose you. They're going to try to shut you down because they're going to hate the things that you have to say. Just as much as the spiritual wickedness in Jesus' day conspired to put him to death because they hated the truth. They hated what he had to say. 
And we need to understand that this is also going to be the reaction that's going to come when you choose to be strong for the Lord. Verse 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We need that armor. And I'm going to leave you with just the homework of going through. You can check through all the armor of the, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of faith and your feet shod with the preparation of the peace of the gospel and uh, the sword, right? We've got the word here is our sword, all the different elements of the armor that you need to have in order to be strong. We need... Christianity is in need of strong leaders. If there's going to be any type of revival or resurgence or anybody, anything that's going to be done positively, we need people who are willing to stand, willing to be strong and to lead people into the battle. If you're interested in that, keep, keep coming to these Sunday nights and, and get all these characteristics because we need a lot more strong leaders. Let's bow our head and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great examples that we have in Scripture, dear Lord. And we thank you, most importantly, for being our strength, for being the one who will fight our battles for us, dear Lord. I pray that you please give us wisdom and discernment to know right from wrong, help us to be on the right side of things. I pray that you would please strengthen us in our fights, in our battles, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just um, raise up a, a new group of leaders, people who are going to be able to carry the torch forward and to just, with, with zeal and vigor and commitment and integrity and strength, be able to, to lead masses forward to do your work and to preach the gospel and to not back down to the opposition and the wickedness of this world, dear Lord. We love you and we just ask for your blessing today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.